Thank you very much. Man, it is good to be here, good to be in the house of God, good to be with you guys. And I, I'm just going to tell you, I was in the back praying a little bit beforehand, and I was just like, man, these people are excited. There's a lot of joy, and I was encouraged in there listening to the to your sounds of just, you know, the week gone by, right? And you're like, everybody's catching up, it's family, and you're like, hey, how's it going? What's been going? And I just could hear it, and I was like, oh, I'm excited, I'm excited, because um, I grew up in Altoona, Pennsylvania, so I'm from Altoona, and my grandparents uh, used to own a trail. We called it the trailer. It was really a trailer near Knoll's Ice Cream over there near Glendale. It wasn't in the year round, but it was it was over like back in the woods, little acre or so of ground. And I remember, you know, it's it's a 20 minute drive to Glendale from Altoona. You know, if you just get there. But my grandfather always used to drive me around and say, "We're going to take a shortcut," you know. And his shortcut seemed to last like an hour. But we, I would be up here through Patton, you know, he's just saying August, all these different places. We, we, we went to the trailer 20 different times, 20 different ways, and I would always be like, where are we? But I was reminded, you know, when you're, when you're from Altoona, you're like, we're going up the mountain, you know, people are going down the mountain. Like what? But I just, you, you don't stop when you're young and really realize what God has done. And what he is, he's built and designed. And I was driving up here about two weeks ago with my wife to visit with Pastor Laura. And then this morning, and I was reminding the kids, I said, look around. Look at how beautiful it is up here. Like, I didn't see this before. I was blind, but now I see. And I was just so amazed at what God created. And I think back, and I thought back to my grandfather taking me to the shortcuts. And I was so blessed and thankful that he did, because this was just a reminder, a recollection of what God can do in and through us. And so I want to start by just honoring Pastor Laura and her husband, Will, and, and just saying thank you. You guys are, were a blessing to us as we, when we met you. Um, they are ama- she's an amazing pastor. Can we give it up for Pastor Laura? Like, amazing. Like, we sat there. We left like, huh? Like, really? This is amazing. Like, can you? And then I'm talking to Jason. He's telling me his God story, how he got. And I'm like, really? Really? This is God. You are up to something. God, what are you up to? And so I was just so encouraged leaving her. And then this here and meet, she's like, oh, you wait. I'm like, you got a fellowship. Yeah, yeah, our people like the fellowship. I'm like, so do ours. This is pretty interesting. So I just want to just thank her and her husband. I know they're on travels. The last I saw, they were in St. Louis. So I didn't hear about the hailstorm. So we bless you. And I, I don't know. I just feel like we need to pray. And, and, and just, I, we raise our, let's raise our hands to heaven. And that makes you uncomfortable. Raise it anyway. Let's get uncomfortable and just say, Father, we thank you for Pastor Laura and her servant husband, Will, God. We bless them as they go out, God, seeking you. And God, I pray for at every town and every city and every destination that they stop, that there's a God encounter waiting for them. And that there's going to be God encounter after God encounter. And God, they're going to end up encountering you in a full measure of healing over Will's body because cancer has no right there and we command that thing to die right now in Jesus name and that life will come in life to the fullest and God I pray as they come back so full of fire that he's going to get up here and share story after story after story and you're going to get sick of the stories but you're not because you're going to love it and it's going to share and it's going to be a testimony to what God has done in his life and so God we declare healing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And man, I just want to also extend our blessings from, from our pastors, uh, Pastors Jessica and Jim Kilmartin from Center City Church. Pastor Jim and Jess are amazing, just like your pastor. Like, sitting with them for two hours will change your life. Sitting with two hours changed my life. Like, it's just, they are just there's something going on here. When he called me about a month ago and said, I, I think I want to send you up to Crosscut Church to, to, to preach. And I'm like, all right, well, like, where's that? He's like, Hastings. And I was thinking, I'm like, Hastings, where's that? I know it's somewhere nearby. And so I just was like, God, what are you up to? And if you get anything from me, maybe you check out early, maybe you fall asleep, whatever, it's fine. I taught for 18 18 years. Kids fall asleep all the time, so it was good. But I'm fine with that. I might wake you up, though. Just be ready. But I will tell you, it's, 
It's such an honor and a blessing when you're around the people of God. And our pastors are, are like that to us. But there is a God connection. Now, some of the obvious folks might just say, well, CCC, Crosscut Church, Center City Church, right? Oh, that's three C's, three C's. Well, that's okay. I was doing some, some research to find out the youth here is called Ignite. Our youth is called Ignite. I'm like, okay, well, that's obvious stuff. But there's something deeper that God is doing here. There is a DNA that is the same in Pastor Laura that is in Pastor Jim and Jessica Kilmartin. I'm telling you, there's a DNA that's the same. It's a kingdom mindset. And if you don't know what that means, uh, we're going to hopefully unpack some things. But there is a kingdom mindset. And then there's a religious mindset. So you, if you've come out of religion, you, that religious mindset can, can grab a hold of you and try to keep you down. But the kingdom mindset sees vision. It sees things that weren't here before, but are here now. Like this building, when we walked in and I saw the exterior, and I'm like, oh, what's up? What's going on? Because I just can't wait to get in because I love buildings. In fact, our church is renovating a 150-year-old Methodist church right downtown Altoona beside the cathedral. It's, 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 it is being renovated. And part of my job is helping move that process on. And it's a blessing to see things come alive. And so religion will keep you dead. Jesus comes to bring life and life to the fullest. And so for me, um, coming here and knowing what's in the building, when we got in, I was like, ooh. And then Pastor Laura with her vision is going, and this is the daycare, and this is a space we're going to use later. And then that property, we got parking. And then there's some over there. And then there's something there. And I'm like, oh, she's got the same DNA as Pastor Jim and Jessica Martin. And I'm like, what are you up to God? And so there's a lot of connections that God is doing. It's not by accident that we're here. If you believe that, that's religion. Oh, everything happens for a reason. I used to hear that. It does happen because God's up to something. And God's up to something in your midst as well. And so just a little, I want to also bring greetings from my family. We're sitting up here. Um, uh, my wife, Shannon, of 18 years, just this year, we just celebrated 18 years of marriage. My oldest daughter, Maya, uh, Addison, Matthew, and Hope. And we are just so honored and blessed to be here. And so um, just a little bit of background about me just so we can maybe you can go, okay, that makes sense. So if I move back and forth a lot, like a tennis match, like, you know, I'm over here. You're watching this ball. I'm a health and phys ed teacher, Okay. For a long time to teach in health and phys ed, so I can't sit still. And I, I was talking, I was saying, I'm going to move. I might move there. I might go over there. But I'm going to do my best to stay within the poles, right? I'm really do. If I grab this, it's just so I don't go over there. So I, it's not because I'm spastic or I'm weird or something wrong with me. It's just because I got to hold on to something. And they gave me the handheld mic so I didn't do all of this and scare you. So I promise you, it's just the years of health and phys ed, and most of those years were elementary health and phys ed. So that's going to require something from you. And some of you are like, I don't like this guy already. But participation. God wants us to participate in what he's doing. And too many of us aren't in the game. We're on the sidelines, and then the coach is like, and I just saw this happen uh, in a game over the summer. A, co a coach is like, hey, you're in. The kid's like, huh? Never mind, I can't use you. You're not ready. God wants us to be ready and prepared for the move of God that he has for us. And so growing up in Altoona, I grew up watching my parents go, or my grandparents go to church every day. Like Monday, Tuesday, Monday through Saturday. Ironically, they usually skip Sunday. You know, so they would go every day in the morning, and then they would go to the Saturday evening mass, and they would go there, and it was such a great thing to watch. My parents, as I was younger, would go to church. I heard the stories, Noah's Ark, David and Goliath. You know, I knew Jesus walked on water, couldn't figure it out, and I would just be like, I knew stuff about God. And that's an important thing. You can know stuff about God. It's great to know stuff about God. It's better than knowing nothing about God. And so when I look back, I'm so thankful that my parents trained me up in the way they should go, that I should go. You know, I, I, and, I, and the reason I'm saying all this is because I grew up thinking I had to do something for God. I had to be good. I had to try to, you know, please him or make it, make it um, you know, God, please, did I, I hope that at the end of my days that I did enough 
to get to heaven. And so I went through life for 35 years believing that. And I will tell you, when you believe that for 35 years, you, you, you live an empty life. You're always reaching for the newest car. Maybe if my wife and I get a bigger house. Maybe if I get a snowboard. Maybe if we have more kids. No, that wasn't one of them. But maybe if we get or have, will I ever be good enough? And so religion will trap you in that. I grew up, again, thankful, blessed by, my, by, my, by watching my grandparents, watching and going with my parents. But at 18 years old, I'll never forget, 17, 18, I'm with my cousin. And she, we're looking up at the stars, and we're like, is God real? Like, he has to be real. Like, look. Like, we were out in Sinking Valley, if that doesn't make sense, out Tyrone, out, like, far, out, out, like here. I was just out looking at the stars going, there's millions of stars. This can't be anything but the work of a God. But see, I knew, knew of God. And it wasn't until 35 years old when things weren't so good. My friend had just got done telling me he, was, he turned 40 and he was halfway to death. And I went, halfway to death? That's horrible. You know, and I was watching him try to seek things out. And I was empty inside. I was addicted to nicotine, looking at things I shouldn't have been looking at, drinking too much on the weekends. I was living for me. My relationship with well, my wife was strained. My kids, sure, we had two at the time. And I'm like thinking, I've done everything that my parents ever told me to do. Get a good job. We were both teachers. Have some kids. Have a house. You know, white picket fence. We had a dog, too. I did it all. And I was waiting and thinking, I have 25 more years to retirement. Then I can live life again. And I was like, this is so empty, but I didn't have the answers. And I used to cry myself to sleep. Unbeknownst to my wife, I would cry. My, I would turn away from her and cry and say, there's got to be more to life than this. There has to be. Because if this is it, why keep going? Like, what's the, not that I was thinking of ending things, but I was just like, what's the point? And that's when... I was at a business conference, not a church, not an evangelical, not an altar call. I was at a business conference that my wife the first time drug me to, but it was at Cowboy Stadium. So I'm like, I'll check that out. That seems pretty cool. And I remember this second time at this conference, a balcony level looking at the gigantic television and Michael W. Smith was singing in worship. I didn't even know what worship was. I just knew I had to go. And I just was pulled there. And he was singing, this is the air I breathe. And I'm like, oh, come your holy presence. I'm like, oh, who, who's he talking about? And I'm standing there with 25,000 other people at this event. And I'm like looking and all the Jesus comes up on the screen. Jesus. And I'm like, I know who that is. But I don't know who that is. And ever since that day, this was seven years ago, my life has been completely turned upside down. I had a friend who was a teacher as well that became a pastor, and I asked him, I said, I said, you know, what's going on? He said, I quit teaching to become a pastor. And I go, who does that? I go, that's just, this is before Jesus, so follow me. And he was just like, I, I pray a lot. And I was like, pray a lot? What does that even mean? But once I got it, once Jesus came into my heart and I realized there was more to life, it, everything just started to unlock. Things start to unlock. And when you, you um, come alive when you follow Jesus, it's the greatest adventure of your life. And I don't know if you know that because sometimes we think, like, you're supposed to go to church to get good. You know, you're not here to get good. I was telling our teens the other day, we're here to equip you. We're here to sharpen your, your swords. We're here so that you don't just stay here. You go there. Because this is great. This is where we come to worship God, where we come to, you know, celebrate and, 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 and share and fellowship. But it's out there that we're needed, you know. And it's our job to get healed up in here so that we can be strong out there. And so for me, I... <laughs> It was like an eye-opening experience. It changed the course of many, many things in my life. I realized I could live life and life to the fullest. I, I realized that the Bible wasn't just a paperweight. I never opened this book before in my whole life. And when I would open it by the grace of God and by the Spirit of God, I was able to read this and go, I can apply that. That makes sense to my life now. It was a light unto my feet. 
I started to live in freedom from addiction, from pornography, from, from, from drinking, from, from debt. I was able to live free because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I learned that there was a purpose for my life. I wasn't just here. And if you're here today thinking I'm just here because she made me come, it's okay. You're in great company. I was there too. I went too because she made me do it. <laughs> right? And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for all of those little things that God has shown me along the way. And I realized that I had a destiny, that God has something he wants to do, not me do for him, but him through me. And so for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. It's not so you're captive in the church, it's so that you're set free to go be who God's called you to be in whatever you're doing. And that's, I think, a mindset shift for some people. And so the title of my message is, In the Right Place, at the Right Time, Doing the Right Thing. And so here's where we're going to participate. Are you guys ready? We're not going to do jumping jacks. I want you to look at someone next to you. No, you really do have to look at some. You're all looking at me. I mean, I'm kind of next to you, but not really. Someone near you and say, you're in the right place. Oh, you guys are good. You're better than a church. I got to pull people. At the right time, doing the right thing. All right, now look to someone you don't really know that well. That would be me, because everybody knows everybody well. Whatever. That's fine. Say you're, do, you're in the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing. And that's where Jesus has us. If you just go with the mindset or the question, God, what are you up to? And it's, it's so funny. I was talking to Pastor Jim last night, and he's like, my question for them today is, are you sure you want to ask? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Sometimes I've, I've, you know, do you want to go to Crosscut Church? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I get God, I want to go. Send me. Send me. And so what, I want to dive into the Word, and we're going to go into uh, Mark chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, you can go there. They're going to put the words up on the screen. But let's pray before we read the word, because God's word has power. I don't know if you know, but God's word has power, and he wants to release that power. So, Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the word for Crosscut Church in this time and in this season, God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would release the power of your word on your people. God, open every eye, uh, every ear to hear and see exactly what you want to speak, God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move amongst your people in a mighty way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so as we dive in here, you guys have heard of the disciples, right? And it's like, I love reading the Gospels because I'm always like, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. Oh, who's the best? Am I the best? Am I the best? You know, like, oh, get behind me, Satan. Sorry, God, I messed that one up. You know, I'm like, you know, and there's days where I pull my sword and I try to cut people with it, just like Peter. And so the disciples, they went through stuff, right? And it always amazes me that these disciples walked with Jesus as closely as they did and still messed up most things, right? Like, and I'm like, oh, good, I'm in good company. And I'm thinking, I, you know, I'm just you know, they walked with Jesus. And so thinking about that, they've heard Jesus teach and preach daily. They have crossed the sea with Jesus already with him in the boat. He woke up and just said, peace, and they're calm, you know, and everything. Oh, good thing he's here. He must be the son of God, right? So they've been through some things with him. He's casting out demons. He's healing the sick. He's feeding the 5,000, and this is where we kind of pick it up in Mark, and there's an account in Matthew and in John, but I wanted to choose Mark because my name is Mark, and I thought that would be cool. I'm just kidding. I, it's, it's where God told me to go because I wanted to go to the other ones. He's like, no, 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 it's in here, and I'm like, where is it in here? But it, it says this, and we'll, I'll read it, and then I'm going to break it down for you a little bit, what I feel like God is saying to you guys in this hour. So Mark chapter 6, verse 45 says, immediately, say immediately. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, 
he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars. Because the wind was against them, uh, straining at the oars because the wind was against them. That was terrible reading. Anyway, shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, say immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. And so what I want to do is kind of break down as I felt God stirring in me. And it's awesome when you start to read Scripture, and then you, you, God sends you to a place, and you're like, oh, that's what you're saying, God. And so there is a significance. Mark in his Gospels, and it's so funny because I always wondered why I want things done fast, and I'm always like, come on, come on, come on, come on. And it's like because he says immediately like a million times. And I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense now to me because Jesus, sometimes it's, it's immediate. You can't delay when it comes to God at times. You guys ever heard of, uh, why is it slipping my mind? Instant obedience. You guys ever hear that? Like you want your kids to instantly obey and clean up or do what you ask. If you don't instantly obey sometimes, you can miss it. And so God is, and I love how he says this as, as it's, the story shares, says immediately Jesus made did you know Jesus sometimes makes you do things you don't want to do? Like you think it's like cupcakes and roses. Like I'm like, oh, I'm saved. God is so good. I don't have to do anything now. And it's like, no, you're going on an adventure. You are going on the walk of a lifetime now. I thought we got saved, went to heaven, and that was it. No, 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 no. This has been the craziest seven years of my life. From living in Altoona, meeting my wife at Penn State, going to the, wherever we could get a job teaching, which was Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, the Pocono region, living there for 15 years, God saving us, right? I'm there. I'm literally, God says, you're going to change schools. I, so I changed schools. One year later, he says, you're going to retire. I retire from public school teaching. Who does that, by the way? I was like, uh, okay, I, I say yes. And, I, and then God says, I'm going to move you Back to Altoona, he told me, I told her, she said, we ain't moving to Altoona, I'm going to tell you that right now. And I'm like, okay, that's not instant obedience, so like you, you, God, what are you up to? You need to talk to her. Six months later, that was November, January, we're visiting my parents down at Center City Church, they had just opened, and Pastor Jim used to always ask me weird questions like, what keeps you in Scranton? I'm like, a job, like my family, her family, he's like, okay. And he would just leave these little seeds in my heart. And so when I, uh, it was, we were at a youth event on a Saturday night at 3 o'clock on Sunday morning. She wakes up and hits me and says, God just told me we're moving to Altoona. I'm like, finally. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so with, that's the end of April. We took a month, got our house ready, put it on the market. Within three days, it sold for asking price. We came here within five to seven days, bought the house, you know, put in an offer for the house, got it. We packed up everything in the month of June, put it in my parents' garage, went on a mission trip to Baltimore with the teens from Center City Church, uh, led that, came back, unpacked our stuff, painted the house. I get a call from our pastor's son. It says, hey, Bishop Guilfoyle's hiding a health and phys ed teacher. And I'm like, I don't want that. That's not what I'm looking for. I don't, we have a business. I don't want a job. And God's like, mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is a trick. Queasy. I heard this in the car. I said, you can do what you want to do. And I'm like, I think this is a trick question. I'm like, God, is this? And he's like, and I just knew in my heart. So I said yes, and I just ended my three years at Bishop Guilfoyle, stepping on staff at our church, and God opening up door after door. And why do I say that? Because immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, which could be for a really good reason. Because Jesus is up to something in this, and he wants you and he wants me out of our comfort zone. Because it's funny, the, throughout the week I was like, oh, I'm going to preach, this is going to be great. And then as the day got closer, I'm like... You know, 
I think I got a word. Yeah. Well, maybe I don't have a word. I don't. Okay. You know, and the enemy starts pounding. The waves start hitting you, and your doubt comes in, and unbelief. You know, things happen, and you start to question. But then you get here because Jesus got you out of your comfort zone. And so let's continue on. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him. So he's gone. He, he said, go ahead. It'll be fine. Why does he say this? Because he went up on a mountainside to pray. See, Jesus is doing something while you're thinking you're doing something all by yourself. You might be alone thinking, I'm only on this island by myself. But Jesus is like, I'm praying for you. It's fine. You just go do what I've said. I want you to go do. I want to get you out of your comfort zone. And so Jesus is praying for you. And it says later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. One of the accounts is it said he was up on the mountain where he was and he could see them. He could see them struggling. And I can imagine Jesus at times watching us going, you know, like myself, like, yep, getting ready for that sermon. <laughs> this is going to be fun. I'll pray for you. I got your back. Like, and I'm saying that casually, but I think he's up there literally watching you step in faith in things that you didn't know you were going to do. The guys up here worshiping, as Pastor Lowe said, they're stepping out in faith. Jesus, I don't know if he made you, but it might have felt like he made you. But you stepped out, and you're in the boat, and he's watching you from up high, and he's praying for you. And so Crosscut Church, he's praying for you. He's praying through what is going on and what has gone on here. Um, and so he sees you. Because it says right at the beginning of verse 48, it says, he saw. Everybody say, he saw. Not seesaw, but he saw the disciples straining. See, he sees the strain at times. He sees the voice crack. He sees the, you know, this and that and the other thing, as you were saying. He, he sees what you're going through. And he's not surprised by it. But he sees it, and he's interceding for you. In James chapter 1, verse 2, I've been stuck on this, James, for like months. It says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Some version says patience. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. See, in a season where you're struggling or where you're trying to find your rhythm or things seem like they're falling apart, it's actually right where your testing of faith is producing something. See, faith is meant to produce something. If it didn't produce anything, then it's really not faith, is it? It really doesn't take God to supernaturally intervene for you, does it? It's just, just you doing what you know how to do. But when you step out or step up into things of God, you need to activate that faith. And God is saying that it's going to produce perseverance. But, and I love this part of the verse in 4. It says, let perseverance finish its work. I think as people, we so quickly just want to be like, I'm done. It was really hard. I'm done preaching. I, the, I, I don't, no one's smiling. No, I'm just kidding. So, so you would smile. She's smiling. Thank you. No, I'm kidding. But you get what I'm saying. Like, we want to quit. Oh, I have excuses. I'm tired. I don't want to get up early. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And it's especially when it comes to the things of God. Because the enemy doesn't want you doing that. I heard them call like, hey, guys, if anyone could take care. I, you should all be signed. If you're guy, you should all have your name on that thing. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. It's going to take all of us to do it, to, to, to keep building on what God wants to do here. If everyone says, well, I hope, you know, Wilfred, he's going to get healed. He's going to get healed, so he's going to come back. He'll be good. He'll be good. No, 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 no. It's, what happens is, is God wants to step steps one person up, and what we've messed up in the world is we want to be like the CEO, like I'm in charge of everything. No, 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 in the kingdom, it's backwards. I actually want to raise you up so that you get, you remember Jesus said that you would do even greater things than he did. How can that be even possible? But he wants to do greater things. We need to raise up people. You're singing, raise up the next person. It's not to take your place. It's to take you higher and to pull them up to a new place. And that's what God wants to do as he tests our faith. Our faith. But if, he, if we don't let it finish its work, we can miss it. And it can go without us. And then he continues on in verse 5. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. And I love asking God, what are you up to? 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Man, I'll tell you what, we've gone through a season when we moved here. We had a business that did very, very well. Remember, I was telling you, we, I was able to quit both of us, public school teaching. Our business did that well. It literally, within the, within the first half a year, three quarters of a year, it, it got pulled out from underneath us. We lost everything. And so now I'm sitting there going, I know why you, BG, my salary at BG came. It was the provision that I needed. God, God will meet all your needs, and he met our needs there. But it tested our faith, and God was rooting out money as any obstacle in our heart saying, you don't need that. You, don't, you need me. And there were moments where it wasn't that easy. There were moments for doubt. There were moments of unbelief. There was moments of double-minded. And what's awesome, and I don't know how Pastor Laura is, but Pastor Jim and, and Pastor Jess will do this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you have an answer. Like, what's the answer? And he's like, mm-hmm. Yeah, how's it going? I'm like, it's not going great. Okay. What's the Lord saying to you? That's what I'm asking you for. And growing up in religion, I used to, you know, that guy is the holy guy. He must know all the answers. And I realized that, no, as we read and equip ourselves with the word, we each can help each other sharpen. Iron sharpens iron. And so Pastor Jim and Jess would let us struggle. They would see us just like Jesus. They were praying for us, but they weren't doing it for us. And so if Pastor Laura's is like that, I say yes and amen because you need to struggle sometimes. You need to try to find your tune. You need to try to figure it out. And if you're relying on her or you're relying on someone else, then you're not really relying on God. And God wants us to rely solely on him. You guys with me? And so as we go through this, Jesus gets us uncomfortable. He's got the disciples, and it still blows my mind. Think about it. He went across with them previously, woke up and calmed the storm. So I can't imagine why they didn't have any faith to cross. Like, like didn't one of them just sit there and go like, guys, guys, this is just a test. Remember, he's probably up there watching us. All he has to do is say, be still, and it's done. Let's have some faith. You know, instead they're like, come on, Peter, push. Thomas, stop doubting. We're not going to die. Let's go, Andrew. Let's go. You guys got the moss. Come on. Instead, they're just trying to do it in their flesh, and you can't do it in the flesh. You got to do it not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You cannot do it by your might and your, in your own strength. And so Jesus is putting them to the test, and it says, in verse 49, or back up to 40, he said, he saw them, walk, he saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went. So he sees the struggle. So if you've gone through a struggle here, brother, personally, corporately, he sees it. It's not like he's like, oh, gee, I didn't know that one was coming. He saw it. He's been praying, and it says he went out to them walking on the lake. So he's been walking around here at Crosscut Church, and he's walking. But here's the thing that you got to catch. It says, but when they saw him, do you see him? Are you asking the question, God, what are you up to? Because at, at Center City Church, when coronavirus hit, our team was moving, man. We were in an old building, or like not old meaning old, but we were in a building very much, you know, like this, but it was older. This is beautiful and brand new. But our building was, was going. Our production team was hopping. Our worship was great. And then coronavirus hit. It, it stopped us for about a month. And we said, we're going back. And when we did that, we started to give out food in the parking lot across from our, our new. When I say new building, it's 150 years old. So it's not new. Plasters falling down. Hold. Our one pastor, Brian, fell through the floor in the basement. Like, it was a mess. It, and it's so beautiful now because God's doing a work. But what happened was is uh, one of the guys who's not there anymore actually said, we can't go back anymore. I don't care what it looks like in this building. We can't leave this building. I think God is saying, worship in there. We got a 100-year-old piano out, tuned it, sort of, and our pastor just got on there and went, Burr, and she just started singing. And we worship God in raw. No, none of this. And I'll tell you what, our worship team, they didn't come back. We haven't seen them. You know, we know where they are. We bless them. We release them and bless them and say, 
you're blessed. We want them to go. You release people, and you, you don't hold on to them. You don't, you don't get upset with them. You don't get, get angry with them. And there's moments where it says you can get angry, but don't let the sun go down on your anger. And so, yeah, there's probably times of frustration and confusion, like the disciples. Like, I don't know what's going on. Why isn't this working? But it's okay. You release people and bless them. Let them go. And so it's so important that we, we got that in our hearts because God wanted to move on us in the next thing. And sometimes we hang on to that old thing. Like an addiction, if you go back to it, it's seven times harder to let it go. You let it go and you go back, it's seven times harder again. You can't do that. And so it's so important that we release and we bless people because the thing is the church is going to, people are going to walk in. They might be like, I don't like that guy. I ain't coming back next week to hear his wife. I'm going to tell you that. She, she's, they're going to come back for you. She's, they, I'm sorry. Come back for her. Bring someone, please. No, but bring someone. I'm telling you. You need to know that. It's not about a person that stands up here. I don't know how I'm standing up here. I, I, God put me here. I didn't put me here. God has put you here in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. So I say release and bless because Jesus is walking in your midst. And then what it says is they all saw him and were terrified. Sometimes when Jesus comes on the scene, you're like, whoa, I didn't know you were there. Like, like you know, clean hands, pure heart, clean hands, pure heart, clean hands. Like, God, am I clean? Am I clean? Right? But he shows up on the scene, and then it says immediately, say immediately, he spoke. So sometimes as you're straining at the oars of life and you're straining through your troubles, he comes onto the scene. You didn't even see him. He was there the whole time, and immediately he starts to speak to you. And he spoke to them, and he said what? Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And see, I don't know. I know a little bit about what's been going on, but I don't know it all because each one of you has something going on. And it might not have anything to do with the church. It might have to do with your marriage. It might have to do with your other relationships. Maybe it's a self-worth thing. I don't feel worthy enough to be to be in the, around God or to do godly things. And maybe I feel I'm in depression. You know, COVID really whacked people mentally. It really put people in a dark place where they, they won't come out of the, of the caves. And I don't know what it's like up here, but we have people that are just now starting to come out. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, you need to get ready. I see some empty chairs. You need to get ready because there's people that are waking up, and you have the answer. You have the name of Jesus. You have that cross. I was talking to Jason, and he said something when he was moving back this way. He said something prompted him to come down the hill that way, which is the way I came instead of through the city. And he said, I wasn't really, we were looking kind of for a church, but not. And he said, there it was. People are going to find this place, and you're not, you're like, who are you? Who are you? Where did you come from? Well, I came from over there, and I came from over there, and I came from over there. And so I want to encourage you and sharpen you. Get ready for these people to show up. And so I say, take courage. He is here. Don't be afraid of it. Be welcoming it. Get ready for it. Get prepared. And here's what I love about this in verse 51. He says, then he climbed into the boat with them. See, he was watching. He started walking, and then he got in. And so when I'm telling you, you guys, get ready. He, he's in the boat. And he's ready to, you know, the seas are going to calm down here, and it's about to break free. The fire on the mountain is what we're just going to call it. There's going to be fire up here. There's going to be fire through these towns, and you guys have the answer. Crosscut Church has the answer, and his name is Jesus. And so they were completely amazed. They had not understood the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. See, sometimes when we don't understand stuff, our hearts get hardened. You know what I mean? Like, we just don't get it. Like, God, why did you do that? Why did you do this? Why, why does Will have cancer? That doesn't even make sense. Like, Pastor Lord, it's so awesome. Like, I don't even get We don't have to get it. We just have to let our faith be tested so it produces perseverance and so we can go through things. But there's more to the story. And now, when I, when I read this part, I went, ah. This is why I read this version. So just everybody say, there is more. Look at someone and say, there is more. You, 
All right, the last person point at him and say, there's more. There's always more to the story with Jesus. And so in verse 53, it says this. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. You got to catch this cross cut. They crossed over. See, you've been through something, but now you've crossed over. Now I'm really going to move. You got to keep up with me. Because you were over there, but you crossed over to something brand new. And there's something going on. God is up to something. And so once you've crossed over, what do you have to do? What does it say? You got to get an anchor. You can't let the winds and waves. You're set. You are stuck. You are anchored. You are in this thing. You're all in. You're the one signing up for whatever needs to be done. You're the one talking to Jesus in the market, people about Jesus in the marketplace. You're the one in the hospital saying, I got the, the real healer. Let me pray for you. You are the one with the answer. And once you cross over, I'm going to tell you, my life was empty, hopeless. Uh, it seemed pointless. But once I crossed over and anchored, oh, man, it's been wild. It's been an adventure. It's been the greatest journey of your life. Or my life, your life, my life. Because he wants to take us somewhere. And here's where it gets even better. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. And I always thought, like, why didn't they just say people recognized Jesus, you know, when they got out? But it says, as soon as they got out. See, the moment you get out of the boat, they're going to recognize Jesus. Because when I was teaching, and this, I, I was just saved, and I didn't know much about the Bible. In fact, I played Russian roulette one time with the Bible because my friend told me the answer is in the Bible. And I went, oh, the answer is in the Bible. And he's like, I, I was ready to kill my coworker figuratively. And I said, you know what, I'm going to rip her head off. Old me was getting angry, and I was like, I'm gonna, I, I can't stand her. I don't like her. She's annoying, yada, yada, yada. And he's like, and I, I heard the answers in the Bible. Oh, the answers in the Bible, Chad, okay. And I'm like, Brr. you know, this is the guy that quit teaching to become a pastor. Who does that? So I'm flipping through, and it was like, Brr. and I open it up, and it was like, love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm like, love your neighbor as yourself. Ha! I don't like this Bible. Because the truth sets you free. And I went out, and I'm like, hey. No, I didn't do it like that. But I, my heart got adjusted on my planning period. I can tell you that. And my heart got adjusted. And ever since then, when I crossed over, and here's how I know people will see Jesus in you. I was teaching. God told me my, that school, the very first school, when I got saved, I was like, I stopped living and working my job for me. And I started saying, God, what do you want me to do? Why do you have me in this school? And I started like a little group teaching kids values. Basically, God's values, because they don't have that in school, in public school. So I was like, I need to teach them God values. And I was teaching a small group of kids. And I taught in the Poconos. It was inner city. It was like, it was a third African American, a third Latino, a third white. So it was diverse, mixed. I mean, we had kindergartners, kick teachers, tell them to bleep, bleep, bleep. You know, it was a mess sometimes. But I'm teaching these little kids. And one time, you know, they're not listening. Imagine that. And I was like, hey. Guys, come on. And the one kid looks and he goes, hey, y'all be quiet. Jesus is talking. And I'm like, what'd you say? He goes, Jesus is talking. They need to be quiet. And, I, at, at, you know, being a young Christian, I'm like, that's so awesome. He sees Jesus. Like, I must be doing something right. But today, I'm like, he saw Jesus. How did that happen? Like, what did I do? All I did was teaching him what God says about some things, and he could see Jesus in me. He can, they can see Jesus in you. When you leave this place, this is, as our uh, bishop that oversees our pastor, this is a sheep shed, he calls it. He said, this is just to gather, but it's to go out. And so what happens is it says this, they rec people recognize Jesus, and the people ran. It says they ran throughout the whole region. They ran from Crosscut Church into the town of Hastings, into Patton, then to Carrolltown, then Northern Cambria, then into Evansburg, Loretto. They ran and they carried their sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And whenever he went into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them even touch the edge of his cloak. And all, say all, 
who touched it were healed. That's the exciting part. part. That's the, the part I want you guys to get. As you cross over and you anchor, healing is coming. There is healing coming for Wilford. There is healing coming to some of your hearts. There is healing coming to your, your church corporately. There is a healing that Jesus wants to do in this hour, and he is crossing you over from one place to the next place because they're coming, because they're running. Some of you are going to leave this place. You're going to say, this kid, this guy preaches, blah, blah, and they're going to be like, what? you got to open your mouths. That's why I'm having you open your mouths, right? Because it's easy to just sit there and hear a great message and go, yeah, that was pretty good. We'll go eat and we're going to leave. But you got to speak to your situations. And I really believe as we close here, I believe God wants to do some healing inside first. Because in order for you to go out, if you go out hurt, if you go out bitter, if you go out with unforgiveness, if you go out with any kind of depression, suicidal thoughts, anything, addictions, you're going to project that onto people. Even though you don't know it, you're not meaning to. And so God wants to do a healing here today. And I don't know if you guys are okay with that, but I really believe that, that, that if you are going through something, and I really felt the Lord say in worship that there is an offense. Some people have been offended. And listen, if you don't raise your hand, no, you don't have to raise your hand. We're all offended. We can get offended so easily. But there might be a deep level of offense. And, and, and even in the worship songs, unforgiveness. Your forgiveness, but there might be still some lingering unforgiveness. And then I really felt the other one was a self-worth. Like, am I really good enough? Am I really good enough? You are good enough. You are worthy. Not because you're worthy, but because he's worthy. And so I just want to pray for those three things specifically, that God would do a deep, deep work in your hearts today. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you all to stand on your feet. I want you to stand up. And I don't know each and every one what you're going through, what you've been through, but God does. Because he saw you up on the mountain. He's been praying for you for this moment. And I'm hoping that you see him. You see him in your situation. God, what were you up to when that happened? God, what were you doing in the midst of that? And so I just want everyone to take a moment. I want you to close your eyes. Because sometimes when we open our eyes, we're distracted. We're seeing the wind. You're seeing the waves. And I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. And I want you to take a moment, and I want you to start to, to, to seek out him. Even talk to him if you want. But God, I pray right now for every single heart in this place, God. I pray for those things that may be holding them back, God, that are anchored on the wrong side of the lake, God, that you are taking them to a new side. And God, I pray specifically for anyone that has been offended, that offense has come in, God. I pray healing over offense right now in Jesus' name. God, I pray for any unforgiveness, any bitterness that may have rooted itself in. And God, I pray right now, I break bitterness's back in Jesus' name. And we declare wholeness. We declare freedom. We declare your goodness, God. We, we declare forgiveness in this place, God. We declare the blessings and the relief releasing of God into this place, God. And I pray for self-worth, for doubt, for double-mindedness, God. And I pray right now that anyone that is Holy Spirit go through here that has struggled with doubt, has struggled with um, just double-mindedness, God, I pray right now, God, you will bring a level of healing, a deep level of healing, that God, you are the author and finisher of our faith. You are the one that brings our worth. God, you are the one that, that has known us since we were in our mother's room. You are the one that knows the plans for us, God. And I just pray, God, that you release your freedom, release your healing today into the hearts of the people of Crosscut Church in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And if there's anything you guys are going through, anything deep or anything you need prayer for, um, I would love to pray, pray with you on that or your, your prayer team, anyone that needs to step forward. Because sometimes, and I'm just going to say it, sometimes we want to, that's great, he did an altar call up my seat. But I think for some of you, it's time to cross over. It's time to step up and say, I, I need
I need you, Jesus. I need to come into agreement with prayer. And so we're here to pray, to be, you know, whatever you need, whatever that situation is. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Pastor Laura. Thank you to you guys. Thank you for your participation. It has been a true blessing, a true honor to be able to speak what God is speaking. And I just pray the blessings of God. And if you need prayer for anything at all, please just come on up and we can pray with you. And um, make sure you come back next week because I know my wife's got a word. They said I'm like fire and she's, or I'm like rain and she's like fire. So get ready. And it is going to be an encouraging word for sure. So I just thank you guys. I hope you have an amazingly blessed day. And it's just been an honor of mine to be here with you. So thank you.